So, so just as hell begins in the here and now, so does heaven begin in the here and now. And it's all based upon the grace that God gives us and our response to that grace. The truth that God teaches us and our response to that truth. It all hinges on how we unpack the grace that God has given to us or push it away, push God away, push him out of our lives. Now Christ shares with all Christians the hope of a new life in heaven, which is salvation. And this occurs through the Christ event. Faith in Jesus Christ and his church are necessary as well. And we must be free of unrepentant mortal sin that is forgiven if we are to enter into heaven. Faith in the resurrection does not take away our need to grieve, um, but it does give us a different perspective. We grieve not like pagans. We grieve as people who believe in God and his power to save. Somebody once asked, well, well, when I go to heaven, I find out that I, um, whoever, is in hell, will I be grieving over that? No, because your friend who's in hell is perfectly happy to be in hell, as he was just perfectly happy to be living in hell here on earth, okay? Uh, so just, just get over it. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll be perfectly happy. God will give them what makes them happy, okay? Uh, and if living life without God makes you happy, then God will give you that. Uh, if being unrepentant it makes you happy, God will give you that. See what I'm saying? Uh, so those who are in hell are perfectly content to be in the squalor that they're in, just as they were content in this life. Now my question is, can anybody really be content? God knows. I can't make that decision. That's why God makes the judgment, not us, uh, in that regard. The church has taught that there is hell, okay? And the fallen angels are definitely there. Lucifer is there and all of the other fallen angels. But the church has never said that any specific human being is in hell. We don't really know. But we do know it is a looming possibility theoretically, okay? Uh, and based on the criteria that I just uh, mentioned to you. So the moment of, of passage from this life to the next, our time for gaining or losing merit has ended. There are no second chances. Either a person is in a state of grace or, the, or in a state of unrepentant mortal sin. No repentance or forgiveness uh, for the, those who have not repented occurs after death. Okay, does everybody understand that? You cannot repent at your judgment day. Uh, that should have occurred uh, throughout judgment day while you were here on earth, when God gave you every opportunity to repent. Uh, but at the moment of death, any opportunity for repentance has come to a conclusion. So that is uh, very important to keep in mind. So why do we talk about what happens at death? We have our personal judgment, as we just described. And for those who have died repentant, forgiven of all mortal sin, and in a state of grace, this judgment will nonetheless be rather difficult. Okay? Because for, you, for the first time in your life, you will also see what harm your forgiven sins have caused God and other human beings or cause the grief that you cause God by turning away from it, even though you're forgiven. You will see, all that will be laid bare, how your life of sin has affected others, how your being imperfect has affected others. And in the process of that judgment, you will be purified of all of that, your memory will be purified, and you will be made perfect. How long do you think that takes? Well, in heaven, there's no time, okay? <laughs> time is a product of, of the here and now. Uh, is, it it is a part of limited. We're limited here. Uh, but in heaven, there is no time. So what might seem to us to be a million years, in heaven might be a split second. 
Okay, we don't know. I mean, that's you know a theoretical thing. Um, but there is going to be a moment of purification of many things and enlightenment, and then being made perfect. And what do we call that? Purgation. Purgation or purgatory. Now, I have preached homilies at funeral masses here at St. Joseph's, and most of our funerals, um, the majority of people who attend the funeral are not Catholic. Okay? They're Southern Baptist and Methodist. And I'll say to them, if I, me, me, me personally, if I were to die at this moment, and in the next moment find myself in heaven, something would have had to have happened between the moment that I died and the moment that I'm in heaven where I am made perfect. Because God knows right now I am not perfect, okay? I still harbor bad thoughts towards some people. I haven't totally forgiven others who have harmed me in this life. I'm a little bit at odds with this person or that person. And I have some bad habits and I still sin, although I seek God's forgiveness. I am far from perfect. But if I'm in heaven, what will I be? Perfect. Perfect, okay. I will be reconciled with everybody who I have harmed or who has harmed me. And, you know, some people are harmed in the most horrible ways in this life, the most despicable ways. But if you're in heaven, you have forgiven that person because you've been made perfect, okay? Do you believe in purgatory or not? Yes. If you're going to be made perfect, something has happened between the moment of your death and personal judgment and you finding yourself in heaven. And we call that purgatory. And I'll have Southern Baptists and Methodists and Pentecostals at these funeral masses say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They get it. Okay? Uh, but keep in mind that purgatory is not for unrepentant sinners nor is it a second chance for those who have been unrepentant. Purgatory is for repentant sinners whose forgiven sins have affected other people and continue to do so to this day. For example, I used the uh, uh, story of, of me going into a rage uh, during one of the RCIAs and I go up to Deacon Don because he's made me angry, I'm in a rage, and I rip his arm out of his socket and beat him unconscious with it, run out of the, the, the church here, throw his arm in a, into the old Mogi River, and um, of course you call the police, and I get arrested, and, um, and then I'm sentenced for my crime to prison, which has a parallel to uh, um, uh, purgatory, if you will, penance, and then, um, um, and then I begin to realize, goodness, what did I do? I'm sorry. And poor Don Coates, speaking Don Coates, is in the hospital in intensive care, not expected to live. But then he makes a miraculous recovery. And, and I say, well, gosh, I have to go to confession. And I go to confession, and, and I receive absolution. But then I realize I have to apologize to, to Don Coates. I have to beg him for forgiveness. So he comes and visits me in prison, and, and I beg him for forgiveness, and he forgives me. And, of course, the priest has told me that my penance is the prison time and that I should make the best use of that and be uh, very prayerful. I'm forgiven, right? Don Coates has forgiven me, right? But Don Coates only has one arm now. Are you right or left hand? And I've taken his right arm. Okay. <laughs> and so my forgiven sin my, and is still affecting him, correct? Okay. Uh, so there has to be some justice for that, and that's what penance is, and also that's what purgatory is. Justice for forgiven sin. I think when you hear penance and purgatory, you should be thinking uh, basically of the same thing. So does anybody have anything, any questions about purgatory? Because purgatory uh, is a state where you cannot help yourself. You are totally uh, dependent upon uh, the grace of God, the prayers of the saints in heaven, and the pray prayers of the church on earth. There's nothing you can do for yourself in that period of time to uh, release you from purgatory. But nobody goes to hell from purgatory, so purgatory is really part of heaven. You are saved when you're in purgatory. You are a saved 
person. Okay, you don't go to hell from purgatory. So, um, uh, but you need the prayers of the church in heaven and on earth, uh, as well as the grace of God, to purify you and to release you to the fullness of heaven. Yes. Well, that's a good question. The question uh, is, is all souls day, which is November 2nd, the only day that we can pray for the dead? No, no. You, can, you should be praying for the dead every day. And uh, you should, uh, and, and you, can, uh, you're, you could affect their release uh, any day, anybody's release. So, so it's not, it's, it's a 365 day a week, uh, a day a year uh, proposition. So once we we get to heaven, what will we experience? So now you know the church has traditionally said purgatory is like fire, but it's not in the sense of of, of injury, but but purification, like gold tried in fire, purified by fire. Uh, we are purified of of, of the uh, uh, what do you call it? The uh, what do you get out of gold to make it pure? The impurities were purified. The impurities, yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's what, what the fire means. Uh, but there is suffering, too, right? Because you're fully aware of what your forgiven sins have done to others and done to you. Yes. Okay, um, All Souls Day was a little hard for me because if they're in purgatory and being purified so they can be perfect, if, if this person... Don't they need to do that? Don't they deserve to do that? I mean, what? Injustice, yes. You know, why, why should I have, if it's God's judgment, why should I have an influence? You know, like, let's say I pick my grandma, and she gets out a little early, and her buddy, you know, Miss Betty. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds a little Listen, yeah. So, So I have the power to give my beloved some time out of her. Well, it's not your power, it's the, it's the gift of the church to your beloved, that you're making you some, okay? It's an, in, the church is indulging either you or your beloved. Okay? Now, God is going to be fair about things, so keep that in mind. But, um, but, but some, it, you know, you're in heaven anyway in purgatory, but not in totally free of this purification process. Uh, so it's just a... a uh, an act of love, but God is responding to your act of love for that person. Okay. So, and the reason the reason this question came up for me was actually kind of negative. Um, someone in my family that has died, who was a very horrible family member, you know, my thought, if, if he's not in hell, and he's in purgatory, I don't really want to, I'm not interested in helping him out of that, and I want to But see, see, you're do, you're getting, you're praying for that person to keep you out of purgatory too. Okay. Or shorten your time. If you've made friends with them in the here and now, it won't necessarily have to happen later on, because you're going to have to be reconciled with them if you're going to be living in heaven together. Okay, and you will love him, and your memory will be purified of anything that was wrong in that relationship. Okay, but that can start in the here and now too. Okay, that process. So I, end of the relationship, yeah. I can get him work on. Correct. And working on and maybe the reason why he's not in heaven is that neither of you are reconciled yet. Who knows? Yeah. So that's, no, that's, a, that's a satisfying answer. Yeah. It's hard yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, sir. I just want to comment that love covers a multitude of sins mm -hmm. and love heals many ills. So doing that in behalf of another person. So, that's perfect. Yes? If you pray for someone, they are already in heaven. Does the prayers come back to you? Yes, it would, it would help you, in, and we don't know who's in, out of there, but it, or it could be applied to somebody else. God would okay. apply that. So, so, we kind of, you know, those details we would kind of worry about because you could really go crazy trying to figure all that kind of stuff out. So, I wouldn't get to talk about that. So, what is heaven like then? Well, it's beyond anything that we can describe, but I'm going to try to describe it in how the saints understood it. Someone has once said that while we do not know the material structure of heaven, God has made it so beautiful 
and so glorious that the saints will never tire of the contemplation of its splendors for all eternity. You'll never get tired of heaven. There will always be something more, something eternal. Speaking for herself, St. Teresa of Avila writes, and this is uh, something that she received in the private revelation, and private revelations are uh, graces that people receive for themselves that can be shared with the church, but if you don't want to believe it, it's mine. But this is so nice. I think not. Um, Well, we'll get into that in a second. Okay. Okay. The Blessed Mother, and this is what she said to uh, St. Teresa, the Blessed Mother of God gave me a jewel and hung around my neck a superb golden chain to which a cross of priceless value was attached. Both the gold and the precious stones thus given to me are so unlike those which we have here in this world that no comparison can be made between them. They are beautiful beyond anything that can be conceived, and the material whereof they are composed is beyond knowledge. For what we call gold and precious stones, besides them, appear dark and lusterless as charcoal. St. Augustine, St. Anselm, and many other saints do not hesitate to maintain that there are in heaven real trees, real fruits, and real flowers, indescribably attractive and delightful to the sight, taste, smell, and touch, different from anything we can imagine. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, this perfect life with the Most Holy Trinity, this communion of life and love with the Holy Trinity, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with the angels, and with all the saints, is the ultimate end and fulfillment of our deepest human longings. The the state of supreme, definitive happiness. To live in heaven is to be with Jesus Christ. The elect live in Christ, but they retain, or rather find, their true identity and their own name. However, it is not until the last judgment that we will have bodies in heaven. But at the last day, we will have them again, and those bodies will be so beauteous that nothing in this world can compare with them. In a private revelation to St. Bridget, Mary said, The saints stand around my son like countless stars, whose glory is not to be compared with any temporal light. Believe me, if the saints could be seen shining with the glory they now possess, no human eye could endure their light. All would turn away dazzled and blinded. Some authors say that the glorified body will have four attributes. Beauty, impassibility, the glorified body will be able to, will be incapable of suffering. It will never be sick or infirmed. It will not grow old or unsightly. Agility, the glorified body will be able to traverse the greatest distance with the speed of thought. Subtlety, or subtlety, uh, the faculty of penetrating all matter or passing in and out wheresoever it will. We will also experience pleasure and gratification by means of the five senses. Sight, the power of sight, will be so perfect that nothing can be hid from our eyes. We will see what is distant as distinctly as what is near. The greatest sight, of course, will be seeing God face to face in the beatific vision, our hearing. We will hear the canticles of the angels and the soft music of their harps. The nine choirs of angels will sing the praise of God and we will hear it. Smell. The delicious odors of paradise surpass anything we can imagine and there won't be anything that stinks. Taste. The saints will taste a, a sweet sustenance which will satisfy them. Touch. St. Anselm says, in the future life, the saints will experience a feeling of untold comfort and ease. The pleasurable sensation will pervade every member of their body, producing a wondrous sense of peace and contentment. The saints will take very great pleasure in beholding one another, in conversing with one another. They are united by a bond of mutual love or charity. Each one will be able to see into the other's heart and know how great 
is the affection he feels from him. How many of you want to go to hell? <laughs> Who wants to go to hell? I mean, you know, really. You know I mean? But there are those that think that what I just described uh, is not anything nice at all. They prefer all the dark things uh, that they can get into. So, so that's a little bit of heaven. We really don't know what heaven is like. All of these are theoretical propositions, and more than likely, there is truth in that. But the point is that there is eternal happiness in heaven. You'll never get bored, uh, and, and, and there will be much to do and much to enjoy. Um, that brings us then to uh, the general judgment at the end of time. The Catholic Church does believe that this world is progressing to uh, the end of what we call salvation history. That salvation history will come to a conclusion just as it had a beginning. Uh, and it began the moment that Adam, Adam and Eve uh, sinned. Uh, salvation history to bring people back to God uh, and to establish an eternal covenant that can never be destroyed. So at the end of time, um, and we don't know when, the church makes no predictions and we ridicule those who do. Uh, there, we, so we don't know how long it will be. And we always recognize that anything that you read in the book of Revelation or any apocalyptic literature could be applied to any period of salvation history. Uh, so the, the sufferings of the current are, are no worse or no better than what they experienced in the early church or in other times when there was great persecutions of, of God's people. But at the end of time, when the Lord does return, and we do believe that there will be a second coming, he will judge the living and the dead, but in a more general sense, that he will lay bare all the institutions of the world and all the decisions that were made, for better or for worse, uh, in terms of people and wars and all the rest of that, and we will know everything. And those who have died or are repentant will be separated, the sheep from the goat, goats, and the sheep will be on one side, and those who are unrepentant uh, uh, will be on the other side. And that includes those who have died, okay? So those who... So there will be a reunion, so to speak, uh, of everyone, living and dead, saints uh, and the condemned. And those who are condemned, even those that are currently living, will receive, uh, will have a bodily resurrection and live forever in hell with that body, whatever that will consist of. Okay, and those in heaven will live with their body, their glorified body in heaven. So those who are in heaven right now, except for the Blessed Virgin Mary, do not have their body. Their souls are in heaven. At the end of time, there will be the resurrection of the dead, and the souls will be reunited with this glorified body. Uh, and how God will do that is a mystery, uh, but we know that it will happen. Okay? Uh, and that's what we call the final judgment when then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And all will be redeemed. Even the material will be redeemed. All that God created will be redeemed and forever restored. So in a sense, you can speak about the materiality of heaven if you believe that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth uh, uh, at the end of time. So, so, so there is going to be a tangibility in heaven. And, uh, uh, and that will be for, for eternity. We do not, as Catholics, believe in the rapture. Okay? Uh, we do not take the book of Revelation or any of the apocalyptic literature literally. Um, we believe that however the second coming will occur, uh, there will be a final judgment and then a new heaven and a new earth. There's not going to be thousands of years of the more strife uh, for those who are left behind. We don't believe in that as Catholics. That's uh, a late development even within Protestantism. Maybe, Eugene, you could tell us when did the whole theory of the rapture start beginning. Like in the 1920s? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we've had uh, almost uh, 2,000 years of Christianity, and then in the 1920s, somebody got this bright idea that there was a rapture because of how they started to interpret certain books of the scriptures. Um, that's not Catholic teaching. We do not believe in the rapture. Now, Protestants believe, some Protestants believe in the rapture, and who are the ones left behind? Catholics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> 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 Don't say 
thing no one ever told you this <laughs> when you're left behind. Well, how do you know this side of the calico you're left behind? Anyway, uh, just, just, just uh, that's not our, 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 our belief. And nor is it the belief of most mainline uh, Protestant uh, denominations. Mm -hmm. Methodists don't believe in it, uh, Episcopalians don't believe in it, Presbyterians don't believe in it. Uh, it's, just, it's just a small group of fundamentalist uh, uh, Christians who believe in that. And that only began to develop in the 1920s. Uh, um, now, just a few other things before we get on to our rehearsal, because I don't want to be here all night. Um, it is important for Catholics to receive not only the last rites as they're dying, but the last rites of the church after they're dead, okay? Uh, so, that means they should have a Christian funeral, uh, or a Catholic funeral. Now, for a Catholic funeral, uh, there are three phases to the complete Catholic uh, service for the dead. Um, the first phase is called the vigil for the deceased, which normally takes place in the funeral home, the night before uh, your burial. Um, in the olden days, that would have taken place in your home. Uh, how many of you are aware, maybe had relatives maybe growing up where um, you would have the dead in your house? Uh, and then you would go, you know, to the church. And to the, well, that was the custom in most places. Funeral homes are relatively recent uh, development, but but today most people use funeral homes. So the vigil for the deceased is in the funeral home, and it's a part of your visitation. <clears throat> so let's say that you have visitation from six to nine. Well, at seven o'clock the priest comes in or the deacon, and he does a prayer service that might last uh, fifteen or twenty minutes, and it's usually done in the chapel of the funeral home or the viewing room. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's a formal prayer, but it's not real formal. And then you continue on having uh, your, your, your visitation, greeting people and talking. If you're Irish, uh, it's a drunken brawl. No, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, Catholics come into work. So that, that's all right, just as long as it's done within, uh, you know, reason or, or moderation. Um, then the next day, you would have the funeral mass, which typically would be at the church, or would be at the church. Uh, and, and we pray for the repose of that person that's died. So we're praying for the dead at the funeral mass and the night before. And then after the funeral mass, you would go in procession to the cemetery for the uh, blessing of the grave and, and what we call the final, um, uh, what do you want to be? What's the word? The kind of, no, not the internment, it's a committal, the rite of committal, where we commit the body to the ground. Uh, and bless the ground and, and, and say just some concluding prayers. Then after a person has died, you can go come to the rectory office and have masses said for them. Normally there's a donation of five or ten dollars for that mass. And a mass is scheduled for them. So you're praying for them after they die. Many people will have multiple masses said for people for, for years sometimes. Uh, and that's perfectly uh, okay. Now you can also have an abbreviated funeral rite in the Catholic Church. We recommend the full thing, but we recognize sometimes people, for whatever reason, prefer a shorter version, and it's, it's a pastoral decision. So you could omit the vigil the night before. We don't recommend that, but you could. Uh, and maybe not even have visitation at the funeral home. And maybe all you want is the rite of committal, the graveside service. That is permissible in the Catholic Church. But then you're missing out on extra prayers for that person, and you're missing out on mass. Or you could have a funeral home service the day of the funeral, where it's not a mass, but it's like the first part of the mass. Uh, and then we would go to the cemetery from the funeral home for the burial. Uh, so there's options. I always recommend the first, but then if there's some issues with that, there are, are you know, we can work with you in terms of that. So it's not rigidly uh, decided. But what is church law is that the body must be given a Christian burial or entombment. Okay. Now, it's a no-brainer that that will occur when you're dealing with the body, correct? I mean, nobody's going to take the body home after the funeral service and, and store it in the closet so that their loved one is closer to them, correct? Okay. <laughs> it's just common sense we're going to take this body to, to be buried. You give this person a Christian burial. But now, the Catholic Church in the last 30 years has allowed for cremation, although the burial of the body is preferred in Catholic tradition. Uh, we do now allow for cremation, but we insist that the 
ashes be treated as though they are the body, or the ashes are the body, and that the ashes be given a proper Christian burial or internment at a particular place that is sacred ground. Okay? So we are not allowed as Catholics to take your ashes and sprinkle them around the tree so that your dog can go and poop on them. Um, okay. <laughs> or to uh, sprinkle the ashes in the ocean uh, so that the fish will have uh, seafood. Um, or for you to take it and place it in your home on your uh, fireplace mantle so that your loved one is still with you in the home. Okay? It, is, you know, um, it has to be in sacred ground. Now, if you want a cemetery on your property, fine. But bury the ashes. Uh, in sacred ground. That's required by church law. We, I have discovered as a priest that we lose control with what happens to the remains once there is cremation because people are doing so many weird things with the ashes that have nothing to do with our Christian tradition of burying people and giving them a Christian burial. Uh, and we have to call a spade a spade on this and say to Catholics, do as the Catholic Church says here. Don't do these silly things that you see on TV or these romantic ideas of what you think your loved one would want. He's either before God being judged, he's either in hell or he's in purgatory or he's in heaven. Okay? He's not going to enjoy being sprinkled in the ocean. Uh, so just be aware of that. Okay? Or made into a dime. I think you can take the ashes and thrust them into a dime. Uh, or now people are separate, you know, putting the ashes in different vials and spreading the loved one to different people. What are we thinking? Question? I have a friend in Atlanta whose mother wanted her ashes to be spread in Neiman Marcus because that was the place she had the most fun. At Neiman Marcus, right? So it's all these silly things start happening, you know. But if, if we were dealing with the, the corpse, they would want the body at Neiman and Marcus. Uh, so, so, so we just, you know, we have to keep that in mind. We're commending the person to heaven. Yes, to die. When you have a funeral mass and you are cremated, is it necessary to have the body there before the cremation, or do you, can you now have the ashes there? That's a good question. We've had, we've been doing things in a confused fa fashion, and we've had different laws at different times in the last 30 years. The preference, again, is that the body would be present for the funeral mass and cremated afterwards. And then we would set a time to, to bury the ashes. But we now do allow for the ashes to be present in an urn, and uh, so they would be treated as the body would be during the funeral mass, and then we would go from there to inter them either in a column barrier or in the ground or in the above ground too. Um, but again, we're losing control of that because people are taking the ashes to other places they tell us. Well, he wants to be buried at the cemetery in New York City. Well, okay, fine. And then three years later, I find out that he is still in the house on the map. Uh, so, 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 you know, we, we need to, to, to make sure that we deal with this uh, appropriately. Is there any question on any of our, our Catholic customs? Yes. Oh, very good. Um, you, the Catholic Church does allow you to donate your body to science. Uh, I haven't had it happen in this parish, but when I was stationed in Augusta, the Medical College of Georgia was there, and many parishioners donated their bodies to uh, the medical college. And that's perfectly uh, legitimate. We hope that the medical college was creating bodies with dignity. And in fact, they did. I would be called once a year to be a part of what was called a Camilla service, where the, the cremains were actually buried in a cemetery. All the people that were, were, were cadavers were cremated and then together put into the ground. And I thought it was wonderful recognition that the Medical College of Georgia was doing and that they were inviting uh, different clergy to be a, a part of it. So that's permissible. And you may uh, donate your organs after you die. The problem is, and I was just listening to the Catholic station, uh, and a doctor who used to do transplants, heart transplants and other transplants, in which he had been harvested the, 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 the organs from a, a, a brain dead person. And he says he doesn't do it anymore because he's not sure about brain death. Because um, you're really harvesting the organs from a person that is warm, heart still beating, uh, blood still being pumped. And he says he wasn't completely convinced that these people were dead uh, when he harvested the organs. So 
I never had thought about, but there's some, you know, leeway in Catholic thinking that, well, maybe brain death is a, a legitimate way to declare someone dead. Um, but he had some questions about that, so. But it is like, yes? Um, just because at final judgment we were supposed to regain our bodies back, is it still preferred to be buried and not cremated? Yes, the preference is uh, burial of the, the complete body, the intact body. That is choice number one. Uh, choice number two, which is not preferred but is allowed, is cremation. Okay. And we have to be clear on that. And, and, and it's becoming more and more less of a preference because we're seeing this occur uh, uh, afterwards, that people are not treating the ashes as they should. Um, the other thing is cemeteries, no matter where they are, whether it's a family plot in your backyard or, or a, a, a large cemetery, is meant to be a sign of the dead awaiting the second coming and the resurrection of the body. There's a symbol there. Uh, so, so I guess your loved one can wait for it on the mantle, but, um, but you know, there should be a specific place where you're praying for that person. I think there's something also therapeutic about being able to go to where a person has been buried and there's a tombstone marking them and remembering them uh, until the Lord returns. So, uh, and it's always amazing I mean, when I go to the cemetery and I see, oh, somebody was died in 1883 and their tombstone is still there. And I can say a prayer for that particular person because I see their tombstone. So there's something good about uh, cemeteries and, and uh, the expectation of the return of our Lord. You can go and say prayers at a cemetery. Correct. Oh yeah, definitely. The church record, record, the church really wants you to visit your loved ones in the cemetery and pray for them, and do so on a regular basis. Okay. Yes. Um, the resurrection of the dead is that actually heaven, or is that supposed to be after heaven that everyone will eventually come back to life? It, it that'll be heaven. Uh, there won't be salvation. History has come to an end. Those who have not repented and enjoy hell will be there with their bodies forever lost, and, and those who have done good and have been a part of God's plan of salvation and have repented will be with their bodies in heaven. It'll, it, it, heaven is, will be heaven. I mean, it's for an eternity. So this world as we know it will have come to a conclusion. There will be no more sin, okay? no more suffering. Yes, I, have, I have a question about last rites, and I've gotten conflicting answers, uh, even from priests or two. If, if you are present and someone is dying, and there's no priest there, and he's a Catholic person, and you're a Catholic, is there anything all you can do to, to um, aid that person yes. dying? Yes. That's, uh, what, yeah. is, what is the proper thing? What? See, there's a variety of things that are the last rites. Whatever you do for the dying person is the last rites. At one time, the, the, the sacrament of anointing of the sick was considered that, which you had to have a priest for. And it's good that, that a dying person received this. Um, but there's other things that are also a part of that, which would be Holy Communion. If you're an extraordinary minister of communion, you can give them Holy Communion if they're able to receive. If, if you're not that, and there's no priest available, and you can't get anybody from the church there, you can pray the rosary for them. You can make a sign of the cross on their forehead. You can ask God to have mercy on them in a prayer form. You could do the litany of the saints. So there's a lot of things that you could do which would be classified uh, last rites. The most efficacious would be the anointing of the sick, confession, if they're able to go to confession. And of course, for those two, you'd have to have a priest. And then uh, the apostolic uh, absolution, if only the priest can give. So those would be preferential. But in lieu of that, if you can't get a priest there, you can do these other things. Yes? Yeah, I was curious. There's a, a guy named Al. Actually, his funeral is here, but he's a member of St. Peter Claver. And um, if I, as I understand it, he was actually buried on the ground somewhere at St. Peter Claver. Not in a cemetery, like in part of the church ground. And I was curious about the logistics on that. They cremated first, they put him in some cement or something. I didn't know. I was, well, uh, you know what I'm talking about? You know about that. I don't know that St. Peter Claver has this. I, I don't know what they no, have, it's not, but it's I know not that. A Right. I know St. Paul's Episcopal Church over here has a, a, a special place for ashes. And they actually put the ashes in the ground, but they keep using, and then they have a, a, a plaque for all that are, are whose ashes are, 
are interred there. And I don't know if St. Peter Claybrook has that or not. This was unique in the Catholic Church at that time. I mean, I don't think this has ever happened anymore. How long ago was it? Oh, God, what, 92, 93, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, see, when we first started doing cremations, we did some things that were not completely kosher as far as church law. So I don't know what he would have had done or where that would have I'm not even sure if he was cremated or not. I'm just, I'm, I'm I can't that imagine that a body could be buried. I know, that's what I'm saying. I was assuming that he would have. Is there a Catholic unburied cremation site in Columbia that you can go to? Because I that's a good question. One time church law was that you should be buried in the Catholic cemetery. And most secular cemeteries had a Catholic section and a Jewish section. They had a, a you know, Protestant section, and then they had the heathen, heathen section. <laughs> in Italy, where my mother is from, uh, I went to see to the cemetery to pray for my aunt or my mother's sister. Uh, and in Italy, there's a lot of communism in Italy, but it's Italian style, so it's not like Russian communism, but they're atheistic. Uh, but uh, my mother's, one of my mother's sisters was married to a communist, and for years, and they loved each other, he was a good man. But he was a, a communist, he was a non-believer, so there was a section for the communists at the cemetery, and then right across the way was my other aunt, who was buried in this beautiful uh, above-ground tomb because she was had a Catholic burial. Uh, so the cemetery accomplished, had those sections, so to speak. Um, um, Today, though, uh, we don't do it. We do have Catholic cemeteries, but you're not required to use them. We don't have one. Well, we did have one here in uh, Macon. It's at uh, Rose Hill, Catholic, but it's still. So, uh, so in lieu of that, what we do is just bless the ground uh, where you're buried, uh, wherever it is. Yes, Ron? I thought it was kind of neat. In Richmond, they had made one of the walls of this new church into like these tiny little compartments where they put tile and inscribe the name right. so they um, cremated the person and, they put, and it was like a wall of the church and then you put them in the thing. And There's many tile. churches that are starting to do that. Yeah. Uh, There's some liability cool. in the sense that we have to keep it up and all of that and it gets a little bit complicated. It's better just to give it to um, <laughs> a secular company and let them work. So, um, but there is a, uh, Savannah has a Catholic cemetery that's still very active. Uh, there's many options for people to be there. So, yes. I wanted to ask a follow-up to Jim's question about being pleasant when, when a loved one is dying or when anyone is dying. And his question was about a Catholic and what you could do to assist a Catholic. But I was thinking in terms, not that this applies to anybody in my family, but suppose you're with someone who is an unbaptized believer. Don't I remember that any baptized Catholic can perform some sort of a baptism. You can baptize in the event of an emergency where no priest is available. Yes. So, so that's the that's the codicil that no priest is available or you can't get one there over oh, deep right now. Um, but in that situation you have to make sure that the individual wants that. Yes. Okay. So you can't well I guess maybe the deacon who has more recent knowledge uh, education than me can you baptize someone who's not baptized without their consent? Well, the first example that comes to me is uh, on, on many occasions, there would be nurses or doctors uh, on a newborn baby uh, aware that uh, maybe the, parent, <coughs> the parents are Catholic and that the, or the parents are Protestant or believers or just aware of the family situation. And then the baby uh, is at, at the point of death at being born, something like that, or a baby maybe two or three days old or something like that, and we'll, we'll baptize. We have, I think we've had some health officials in our parish here who have baptized in the hospital before. But, okay. so. but I think in an adult who's never been baptized, or an adult uh, that might be in the hospital dying, yeah. do you baptize that person? As an emergency. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. I know in the Protestant church, I have baptized unconscious family members who had not been baptized, but who the family wanted. Family. There was a request from someone, yes. I think in that situation, yes, you could do that, yeah. Uh, but for you to just go in there and the family say, well, there you go. Uh, that might be a little bit. Different. And I think that's how I would approach it. Yeah. That answers my question, because I was thinking in terms of, okay, if there's nothing you can do, if you know there's. Pretty obvious they're dying, 
and there's no priest around, and, and you can't perform, you know, can't give any last rites, you could at least, if this person desired, Absolutely. baptize them and feel that you had done yes. your duty. I think and, you could, okay. yes. Thank you. I, would, I, was, I had a situation uh, recently that um, the family called in for, this is, you were out of town, you know, all that was happening, and the family called in for um, just prayers, they thought that the individual was going to be dying, and, and um, and so we, we set up a baptism time, and then, and then it just turned out we, we had I, I had to respond more quickly to, uh, to, um, to the family. And uh, he was 84 years old, and his whole life he led a very strong Christian life, a very loving life, he talked about God all his life. His whole family was Catholic, and I baptized him about uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and he died at 7 p.m. that evening. So uh, that was, uh, you know, so, that, so the whole family was, you know, in favor of that. Okay, uh, what we need to do now is our rehearsal. Let me explain what, was, what we're going to be doing. What's Sunday?